I got asked by some people in the comments or over Instagram if I could do a comparison of the Nikkor 180-600mm versus the Canon RF 100-500mm. And I think it's somehow an unfair comparison because it's two very different lenses um, designed with, with different use cases in mind. Um, but still, if you want to go for Nikon or for Canon and you want to have a lens, an all-round zoom lens for uh, wildlife and bird photography, I think these two options here are your best choices and that's why I want to compare them a bit in this video um, and I want to compare the points that I found relevant in practice. So I was using both of these lenses side by side in the field and I want to uh, talk about image quality, autofocus performance, image stabilization, background rendering and also some consideration for the whole system because even though the Canon RF 100-500 is more expensive, at least where I live, this combination with the R5 and 100-500 is actually around $500 cheaper than the Nikkor 180-600 with the Z8. It's totally clear for me, if you're invested into Canon with an R5 and a 600mm f4, you will not switch to this Nikon here. If you're already heavily invested in the Nikon Z system, you will also not switch this direction. So I think this video is more targeted to people that maybe don't have a camera yet or just a bridge camera, maybe an older DSLR with a smaller, older zoom lens and you want to upgrade everything and are basically deciding now which system should you go with. Let's start with the specification, the build and the handling of the two lenses. So as you can already see, they are quite different in terms of the dimensions. Uh, the Nikkor 180-600 is 31.6 cm long, the Canon 100-500 only 20.7 cm. Um, that's more than 10 cm difference, that's a huge difference that you really feel in the backpack. The diameter is also slightly different here, we are around uh, 9.4 cm. Here it's 11 centimeters. This difference is not so big, but two centimeters, depending on how tight your backpack is packed, you feel this difference as well. One reason why the um, Nikkor is so much longer is because it's an internal zoom, meaning if I turn the zoom ring here, nothing changes with the size, whereas here this tubus kind of extends quite a lot to a point where it's not quite the size of the 180 to 600, but quite close. Um, there is also, uh, a difference in the zoom ring itself. So here it's a quite short throw from 180 to 600 that I really like. It's not so precise but for wildlife photography I like to switch quickly between different focal length and here you need to turn a bit more. Um, it's still not too bad especially the throw from 200 to 500 is very quick as well. Nevertheless I slightly prefer the Nikon implementation here. Um, what we also have here is a like a friction ring to set how easy or hard the lens zooms and this is only necessary because this is not an internal zoom meaning if I put it to the weak or the loose setting um, and I go to 500 millimeter and I put my R5 like this the lens will automatically go down. I stopped it with my hand that it's not uh, crashing hard but that's not so nice so I usually put it on the tightest setting all the time and then I can also quickly put it like this and even if I push here basically nothing happens. The only disadvantage here is that sometimes if I put it in my backpack with a lot of other stuff, this ring tends to turn. So it would kind of be cool to, I don't know, put a lock to the friction ring. I don't know if this makes sense, that it's not locked in terms of zoom, but locked in terms of the friction that you set. But anyway, not a huge deal. In terms of weight, there is also a quite a big difference. This lens is 2.14 kilograms. Um, as Nikon specifies, if you add the lens hood, you're at 2.27 kilograms. This one is at 1.53. If you add the lens hood, um, it's 1.63. So this is more than 600 grams heavier and this you really feel when you're hand holding it. Um, additionally, because this one is so small, I often don't use the tripod collar and then it gets even lighter. And that's yeah, quite a difference in the hand holding options and I clearly prefer this weight, of course. The filter thread in the front is also quite different. Here we have the typical 77mm filter thread that I also have on my 14 to 35, on the 16 30 to 5 I had, on many 24 to 70s, 70 to 200, and so on. 
Here we have a bigger one, it's a 95 millimeter filter thread. So, you know, filters tend to get a bit more bigger and more expensive. However, I think with this one, probably you don't do so much landscape photography. I think this is a bit more built for landscape photography since it starts at 100 millimeters. And what's also nice here in terms of filter is that we have this little window in the lens hood um, where we can turn the polarizer. And in terms of lens hood, it's not a big deal, but I somehow prefer the mechanism of Canon, how you can fix the lens hood. For me, it's just easier than the one of Nikon. The minimum focus distance for both lenses is variable depending on uh, at which focal length you are. So with the Nikkor, it's between 1.3 and 2.4 meters. And here it's between 0.9 and 1.2 meters. So the longer distance, 1.2 and uh, 2.4 meters, this is at the maximum focal length, so 600 and 500 millimeters. And this means that the Canon offers a higher maximum magnification. You have one of 0.33 here and one of 0.25 here. So if you shoot a lot of dragonflies, butterflies, smaller frogs or other amphibians, um, the Canon is def definitely like the better choice. However, for small birds, even for hummingbirds, for reasonably sized hummingbirds, the Nikkor does more than the, does the job more than good enough. Also worth mentioning, I think, is the difference in the price. And here it really depends where you live. So I could not find all the prices of the world. Just where I live in Switzerland, this is uh, 2,000 US dollars and this 2,500. And I was quite shocked when I checked the prices in the US because there, this one is 1,700 and this is 2,600. So here we have a $900 difference in Switzerland. The difference is on only $500. So you might need to check this for the, your specific country. In terms of build, I already mentioned that this is an L lens, this not, but the build quality is still quite nice. You also have these lens function buttons that are can be reassigned for whatever you want. Um, for example, for um, recalling the focus position, this is not possible with this lens here. Um, apart from that, you have the zoom ring that I mentioned, the focus ring that is rather small, but in a very well, pos very well positioned and I didn't even mind that it's so small. Um, and then you only have the AF, MF and the focus uh, limiter, the image stabilizer, stabilizing mo modes, this is all done in camera with Nikon. Canon has a bit of different philosophy here. We have more switches also for the image stabilizer, which personally I prefer, but it's not a big deal. Um, the focus ring here is could for my taste be a tiny bit more in front, but it's also doing its job quite fine. And then additionally, we have this control ring for setting ISO, uh, focus modes, white balance, whatever. I just need to say it's positioned in such a, well, weird or stupid position. I cannot reach this usually while shooting. I could maybe try with my index finger of the right hand, but in the end, I never used it. So I don't think it's a big loss that you don't have it here. Of course, one big difference is the zoom range. So 180 to 600 millimeter is certainly, I would say nice if you go for the more general bird and wildlife photography. The 100 to 500, yes, it's a bit shorter, but you gain a lot on the lower end. So if you want to do more kind of environmental shots, I think this one really has the advantage and if you do some landscapes. So let's move to image quality. I think something you were looking forward to see. So here I took some test shots with my friend from Costa Rica. The shooting distance was around eight to nine meters and I tried to center this part here, um, focused here. And you can see the setup here. Uh, obviously, I need to start with 180 millimeters. This is the shortest focal length that the Nikon lens offers. Um, and here I shot both wide open. And if we zoom in, uh, you can see not much difference actually. Uh, I think they look very similar. If we go to the edge of the frame, you can see here the overview, how it looks like. I need to say, unfortunately, the Canon doesn't allow to move the autofocus point as far to the edge as Nikon. And I only realized this after the test. So the Nikon is a bit more in the edge. So keep this in mind for, um, for the analysis, but the difference is not huge. And here the Canon really seems to resolve more details in the edge of the frame. If we stop down both lenses by one stop, so meaning the Nikon is now at f8, the Canon at f7.1. Um, I think we really see that the Nikon gains a bit in terms of image quality. They seem very comparable now. And also in the edge of the frame, I would say the Canon still has, well, the edge, but it's uh, really, really tight now. Next, I zoomed into 300 millimeters. Uh, in the center, um, the Nikon is at f6 and the Canon at f5.6. 
Um, so this is one sixth of a stop or something. The difference is like really small. And here I really have a hard time saying which lens is sharper. If we move to the edge, I feel that here Canon is a bit sharper. But again, the difference is not big. If we stop down to uh, uh, f8 on the Canon and unfortunately for the Nikon I stopped only down to f7.1. The results look very similar um, also for the edge of the frame but Canon still seems to be a tiny bit sharper here. Next let's move to 500 millimeters. Um, here I really have a hard time telling the difference. They seem very comparable. Obviously the Nikon is at f6.3, Canon at f7.1. Um, if we go to the edge of the frame here it's also very comparable but for the first time I have the feeling like Nikon could resolve a tiny bit more details but I'm still not 100% sure. And if we stop both lenses down, so the Nikon to f9, the Canon to f10, they again look very comparable and only in the edge of the frame I think the Nikon lens that 180 to 600mm um, gains a bit more from stopping down than the Canon does which is not gaining much more sharpness by stopping down. So 500 millimeter is the longest the Canon can offer, but I wanted to see what happens if you, if your subject is still farther away and you need to crop in a bit more. So I did that. I zoomed the Nikkor 180 to 600 to 600 millimeter, and I just cropped the Canon picture at 500 millimeter so that they are now in the same size. And here I was surprised how well the 100 to 500 held up actually. Um, even though it's now enlarged a bit bigger, it still shows almost the same amount of detail as the Nikon set 180 to 600 millimeters. If we go at the edge of the frame here, we see that the Nikon is starting to look a bit to show more details, but the Canon is still definitely acceptable. If we stop down one stop, it still looks very good on both, but the Nikon shows a bit more detail. And in the edge of the frame here, again, the Nikon shows a bit more detail. I would still call the Canon usable though. Finally, sometimes you still want more focal length. So that's when a tele-extender comes into play. I used the 1.4 from Canon and Nikon and I did the tests again and I'm getting worse and worse with these tests because once you use the tele-extender on Canon lenses, uh, on this lens specifically, the AF field gets a bit smaller with the R5. So now the Tucan is really a bit more towards the center. It's not so much in the edge anymore as the Nikon. So really keep this in mind for the comparisons. Um, because this would mean that the Canon should have an advantage, an unfair advantage in terms of sharpness. Anyway, we start with the center of the frame. So 840 millimeters f9 with Nikon and with Canon we obviously only get 700 millimeters at f10. So I again zoomed in a bit more. And I was again surprised that the difference is not as big as I would have expected. Despite the additional zoom in the, ca the additional digital zoom in the Canon, um, it's doing quite well. We still have a lot of details, uh, just a tiny bit more on the Nikon, but it's doing fairly well. If we go to the edge of the frame, here the Nikon wins. And keep in mind that the Nikon is even farther at the edge of the frame. So here it's a clear win for the Nikon. If we stop down one stop to F13 with Nikon, F14 with Canon, uh, both get a bit sharper, but the Nikon is still has the edge and in the edge of the frame, a similar picture. The Canon catches up a bit, but is still out-resolved by the Nikon. Nevertheless, I would say you could still use the images of both lenses uh, with the tele-extenders. Even if you go a bit more on the edge of the frame, they still offer plenty of detail. So that's it for the studio test, but how well does it perform out there in the real life? I tried my best to find a subject that was still for long enough that I could switch the, between the two lenses. And my first subject here was a spotted nutcracker that was rather close. So I shot it at 200 millimeters with both lenses and I shot each lens wide open. So the Nikon at 5.6, the Canon at 5. And we can see that the background blur is actually a bit nicer with the Canon. I was surprised that one third of a stop is so visible, but we see a difference. Um, even though it's not huge, but it's noticeable. And if we zoom in, the sharpness looks very good on both of them. I feel like the Canon is a tiny bit sharper, but the difference is not huge. And I should also mention, it might depend a bit how much internal sharpening the camera is still doing, like the sensor. Because for example, you can also see differences in noise in the background that the Nikon is uh, showing more image noise. 
Then I found another nutcracker that was a bit farther away, so I zoomed to 400mm with both lenses. Um, now the maximum aperture for both of them was f6.3, and still the bokeh looks a tiny bit different. Um, I feel like the Canon image has overall a bit more contrast, but on the other hand, the edges of the bokeh are a bit softer. It's really hard to describe, and I think also the differences are not so big. Um, anyway, let's zoom in about the image quality. I really have a hard time uh, telling which image is sharper. They both look excellent to me. Then I found a chaffinch that is a bit a smaller bird and I needed a bit more focal length. So with the Canon I was obviously limited to 500 millimeters. With the Nikon I shot at 600 millimeters and um, here we can already see that the framing is, it really makes a difference if you shoot at 500 or 600 millimeters. Also the background gets resolved nicer on the Nikon image. And if we zoom in, both show a nice amount of details. If I enlarge the RF 100 to 500 image even more, that it's the bird is the same size as with the Nikon. I think here we can see that both are still sharp, but the Nikon just resolves a bit more detail. So overall, I had the impression that both were doing quite well, giving nice sharpness. In some situations, I just had the feeling that the RF 100 to 500 is a bit more consistent, giving me more consistently sharp images. Um, but it's not a huge difference, but I felt like, yeah, the consistency was just higher. It reminded me a bit more of the Nikon 400mm f4.5. So in terms of autofocus, I think both lenses performed quite well. Um, there was no hunting for focus that it could not find the subject or was on the subject and then lost it again. However, there were still some differences. For example, the focusing speed was much faster with the RF 100 to 500. I took again a test with my toucan friend on three meters and some trees that were maybe 100, 200 meters away or even farther and I switched back and forth between the two, not using an animal eye detection or anything, just a good classic spot autofocus in the center of the frame. And here the Canon just seems much faster, sometimes the Nikon was not even reacting at all. So yeah, um, it's hard to describe, I also had the feeling when I when the subject was really defocused, sometimes the Canon would still find the subject. And I'm again not talking necessarily about subject recognition, even with the spot autofocus, whereas the Nikon would not move at all. Um, of course, this is a weakness of all mirrorless systems, but the Canon seemed to do better. And I think you can see in this clip here the difference of autofocus speed. Of course, it's hard to say here what is the lens and what is the system um, because I cannot swap the cameras. Overall, I was happy with both. The tracking worked very well. It was sticking on the subject. I also tried some dragonflies in flight. This worked with both cameras. Um, obviously, you needed to pre-focus again with both of them. Otherwise, they don't manage. I found like maybe the Canon was a bit quicker grabbing the subject with the Nikon. You needed to pre-focus a bit finer, but really not a big difference. It's also hard to tell this if you should just shoot this dragonfly for an hour, but um, both were performing very well, giving me nice results. And I felt like for the Nikon, I really enjoyed that this ma uh, manual focus ring, you can set how much you want it to turn to switch from the near focus limit, so 2.4 meters to infinity. This is a very nice feature for Canon. You can just say if you want to have it like depending on the position, so a linear movement or depending on the speed that you turn it. But I found this one somehow a bit more, yeah, it gives me more fine control, more fine tuning. Both of these lenses I would usually not use on tripods, so image stabilization or VR is quite important for me. And overall both were doing very well. For filming the Nikon was performing better, which once more I'm not sure if it's the lens, I think it's more something with the camera because all Nikon set lenses just seem to be better for filming. I did some tests for the photography because I think that's most important for you and it's a bit easier to measure. So at um, 1 25th of a second at 500 millimeter, first with the Nikkor lens with the image stabilization turned off, I got 3% of sharp images, so unusable. If I turned the image stabilization on, I had around 59% of sharp images. 
With the Canon, it was a bit higher. It was uh, actually 77% sharp images. And I remember a few months ago when I tested the set 400mm 4.5, it was performing very, very similar than this one. So it seems like this one, these are just a tiny bit better than this, but it's not a big difference. One thing I noticed when looking through the viewfinder and starting a series of a burst of shots is that with the Nikkor you have a tiny bit more uh, kind of a quick movement when the burst starts of the image stabilizer. The Canon is a bit smoother there, but this doesn't influence the pictures in the end. It's just something you notice if you switch back and forth between these two camera or between these two lenses. If you enjoy bird photography and would like to get better pictures yourself, then I can highly recommend you my new ebook, which covers everything important about the equipment, how you can actually find the birds, how you can play with light, background, different weather situations and so on. So if you're interested, just go to my website. You can find more information there, some screenshots that give you an idea how the book looks like. And of course you can buy it there. The price is around 18 US dollars. So one concern I hear quite frequently about the RF 100 to 500 is the background blur because this f7.1 that is written here sounds kind of intimidating. With the Nikon we have a 200 to 600 millimeter f5.6 to 6.3 and I thought it would be nice to kind of compare the two. So as we have already seen before with the Nutcracker, if we're at 200 millimeters or something, the Canon has one third of, an, of a stop uh, is one third of a stop faster, so it's slightly, the background is slightly uh, blurrier. If we're around uh, 300 millimeter, it's one sixth of a stop. This you probably don't see anymore. At 400 millimeter, the are both the same. And at 500 millimeter, the Nikon has one third of a stop advantage. We're at f6.3 versus f7.1. And you can see this difference in this picture here. So on the left, we have the Nikon at 500 millimeter, um, 6.3 and the Canon uh, 500 millimeter 7.1. So you can see there is a difference. The Nikon is a bit softer in the background, but it's one third of a stop. It's not a crazy difference in this sense. However, if we have a subject that is a bit farther away and we zoom in on 600 millimeter with a Nikon, we're still at f6.3. And on the Canon, we can just stick at 500 millimeter 7.1 and crop in post. And here we see the difference uh, more pronounced. Here the Nikon is really offering a much smoother background. Does this matter to you? It depends, I guess. Um, if you shoot rather larger subjects uh, in front of a background that is not uh, too far away, then yes, the Nikon has definitely the edge. Um, and even there, maybe you will struggle from time to time with f6.3. If you shoot song, small songbirds at a feeder or something, or even um, small hummingbirds, just that you take pictures in a garden, doesn't even need to be at a feeder where everything is set up. You have a quite big magnification and there the 7.1 uh, at 500 millimeter is more than good enough. I would maybe even stop down a tiny bit to have a bit more depth of field. So it really depends on the situation. If you want the absolute best the shallow steps of field, go for a 600 millimeter f4, but then don't complain about the weight and the costs. So both lenses take tele-extenders and I tested them both with the 1.4. You already saw the image quality before, but how are they performing in the field and can I recommend it? Overall, the autofocus performance was still quite good with both of the lenses. I felt with the 100 to 400, 100 to 500 from Canon, it was a bit more consistent. On the other hand, um, you lose a tiny bit of focusing points on the left and right. This is not a deal breaker for me. What is a bit more annoying actually is that on the Canon RF 100 to 500, you can only use a tele extender from 300 millimeter on. So once the teleconverter is in, this is usually not a big deal for me. You can still zoom from 300 to 500. Um, the problem is more for mounting. You need to think about it and mount it like this. And afterwards, once the tele extender is in, you cannot retract it back to 100 millimeters for storing it in the backpack. You need to keep it extended to at least 300 millimeters. And I had this that it then was not fitting in the backpack because there was already other stuff in it. And then I needed to remove the tele extender every time I wanted to put it in the backpack, which can be a bit annoying. And here Nikon has the clear advantage. You can use the tele extender throughout the whole focal range, um, effectively turning it into a 250 to 840 millimeter. Whereas here it's like a 420 to 700 millimeter lens. For both combinations, I would use the tele extender on occasion, but if you really need a lot of focal length, maybe look to a different lens. 
Here, I think the Nikon has the advantage since it goes to 600 millimeters. As I mentioned, for the occasional stuff, you can also crop the 100 to 500 image quite well. So what are my conclusions? First of all, I had fun with both of the lenses. They're both very, very good lenses, but kind of different lenses. So I think it's important to mention that the closest competitor to the RF 100 to 500 from Nikon is not this. Usually, I would say it's the Z 100 to 400. I just did this comparison because this is the longest zoom uh, lens that Canon has for RF lenses at the moment. So that's why I kind of compared the two. So this one is slightly more professional in some things like the um, autofocus, the image stabilizer, maybe the image quality in certain focal lengths. Um, it's much smaller and much more compact. On the other hand, the Nikon lens, the 180 to 600, has obviously more focal length. It gives a better background renditioning, especially from, I mean, only from 400 millimeter on in this long focal length. And also it's much cheaper. So if you're starting wildlife photography, maybe I already gave you an idea in which direction to go. Keep also the camera behind in mind. So in the region where I live, as I mentioned, if you buy this combination, it's still 500 cheaper than this combination, just because the Z8 is so much more expensive than the R5. And if you want to go a bit cheaper, you can even get a Canon EOS R6 Mark II that has an even better autofocus system that destroys both of them, to be honest. With Nikon, it's a bit hard to get cheaper because the Z6 Mark II and Z7 Mark II don't really have good autofocus system. They cannot compete with these cameras and have absolutely no chance against the R6 Mark II. So I wish Canon uh, Nikon would bring soonish a Z6 Mark III and Z7 Mark III. And I wish also that Canon would bring something that is actually competing with this lens. Because as I mentioned, it's not the fairest competitor. I wish they would also bring something like a 200 to 600 millimeter that is in a similar price range. And if it's a tiny bit less sharp, tiny bit worse autofocus and tiny less well stabilized than this lens, and obviously bigger, I think people are fine with this. So if you want to do wildlife or bird photography and you want a zoom lens that is covering basically all of the things, I think this combination here will probably be the better choice, especially just because you have more focal length and a bit nicer um, background blur. If on the other hand you're like me, you already have a 600mm uh, f4, I clearly prefer this one just because it's smaller and lighter. And if I would shoot Nikon, I would not buy this one, I would probably buy a set 100mm to 400mm, again because of the weight and size. So that was it for today. Thanks for watching. I would be really happy if you could support me, buy me a coffee, give me a super thanks, and of course, subscribe to the channel. If you enjoy bird photography and would like to get better pictures yourself, then I can highly recommend you my new ebook, which covers everything important about the equipment, how you can actually find the birds, how you can play with light, background, different weather situations, and so on. So if you're interested, just go to my website. You can find more information there, some screenshots that give you an idea how the book looks like. And of course, you can buy it there. The price is around 18 US dollars.